Hi everyone, I'm Hanovi Schoonover, the Training and Resource Coordinator at Redwind Consulting, and I want to welcome you to the webinar. So today we'll be covering sexual assault advocacy within trafficking in Indian Country. Joining us today is Janet Routson. Janet is a licensed attorney currently working as a legal analyst and coordinator for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. She is working with the tribal leadership and members of the tribe to implement crim criminal jurisdictions over non-Indians for domestic violence, dating violence, and criminal violations of protection orders within the tribal lands and the Tribal Law and Order Act. She is also working with various community groups with special interests such as the education community on truancy and the elder population on elder ab abuse. Janet recently served as the Executive Director of White Buffalo Calf Women's Society, a Native-led nonprofit that provides victim services to the people who reside in and around the Rosebud Reservation. She has been invited to provide training on a number of subject areas that include domestic violence and cultural healing, developing a response to children with problematic sexual behaviors, and partnerships with correlations and victim services for PREA. And before I turn it over to her, as our host Patricia said, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the chat box and we can pause occasionally to address them. And I will now turn it over to Janet. Thank you. And thank you inviting, for inviting me here today and welcoming everybody to the space. Uh, appreciate being able to ask about this subject because uh, it doesn't matter what Native community you live in, um, we are unfortunately uh, a hub um, often for trafficking and how do we deal with that as an advocate. Uh, I've been a sexual assault victim, but I think more importantly is I have personal history around sex trafficking. My oldest sister was trafficked as a child and the impact it had on her life um, and on our lives has always uh, made me an advocate. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that she actually came out publicly that this had happened to her. Um, and at that time, it wasn't viewed as child trafficking or sex trafficking. It was viewed as you know, voluntary prostitution, and we often get those mixed up. So I'm really excited to be here today. Please ask any questions, um, any comments, and if you have information that you could provide to all of us, it is more than welcome. So thank you very much. In particular, we need to take a look at and we have been taking a look at a lot of our focus has been on our missing and murdered indigenous women within our communities. And there's really not a lot of data about how sexual assault, how trafficking impacts those numbers of how many of our women disappear from our communities. And not just women, men, um, our LBGTQ relatives uh, are missing from our communities because of these horrific acts against them. So what do advocates need to know? Um, I know as an organization when I was at White Buffalo Calf uh, looking at how do we ready our agency and how do we expand the knowledge base for our advocates when servicing relatives who have been seeped in the world of trafficking and sexual assault. So we really have to start off with is how we define that. Um, what do we do as advocates, as agencies, as, as people to plan and develop policy, not just within our agency, but within our tribal communities? And who really should work with victims? How do you connect with relatives that have been victimized by
by sexual assault and trafficking within our communities? And what is the bigger picture? What kind of training do we need? What type of prevention can we have? How can we educate our communities about this issue? So this is the federal definition of what sex trafficking is. And, and in part of the work that I'm doing now, I do a lot of research on tribal codes across the nation and, um, and how we define that. Well, from the federal level, um, it is anybody that's affected uh, by um, another person who benefits financially or receiving anything of value. Um, and this is interesting. From participation in a venue, in a venture, which has engaged in the act of describing. So what that means is most often there are more than one individual that are participating, um, and, and, and a venture is actually two or more individuals that are participating in these types of activities. Um, often Native women uh, who come from reservations or whether they're in an urban setting, um, there are always uh, more than one person that participates in uh, having women um, sell themselves in order for them to get uh, not just women but men. So when I say women, I'm trying not to be gender specific, um, to participate in um, engaging in what they call commercial sex acts. So they call it commercial sex acts because some type of value is being, whether it's drugs, whether it's goods, uh, whether it's money, um, and so that's why the commercialism of this uh, is put into the language of the law. It also has to do with federal law, interstate commerce, and how that all side of the how that side of the law works about when um, the United States government can be involved in prosecuting these types of crimes. Um, and so I took out part of this because the other part of um, not just sex trafficking, but trafficking has to do with um, individuals that are forced into slave labor. Um, and I really am not concentrating on that. Uh, just one, I don't have a lot of experience with that. And two, in our community, uh, being way out in the middle of South Dakota, uh, we really don't have an issue with that. Um, so I've just centered this presentation about what we've experienced, what I've experienced um, while working in this field. So tribes have developed their own um, sex trafficking laws. I've seen some that are pretty much worded just like the feds. Um, and if you don't have, um, like Rosebud doesn't currently have its own trafficking law, I just developed uh, with some assistance from others um, our human trafficking code. And uh, part of our efforts is to really not recognize, I mean, it's really old laws talking about pimps. And although there are pimps out there, uh, the trafficking that we more commonly see, we'll talk about more within this. I know in urban environments, we do see um, types of pimping and prostitution. But we there, there is a difference. And so we're really going to just talk about what sex trafficking is and what happens um, in within the confines of sexual assault and how we serve that. So what does it usually look like in Indian country for rural communities like ours? Unfortunately, um, it's more of the family members that are actually uh, participating in trafficking their children. 11-year-old girl becomes pregnant. Um, it was actually her mother that was trafficking her for drugs. Uh, although the feds did convict two different men of rape, um, including um, the biological father of the baby, uh, there were no trafficking crimes um, defined within these charges. She was 11 years old, um, so then the definition for rape uh, 
was that she couldn't give her consent to this. She never would tell on her mother, who was never convicted um, for any kind of trafficking. But what we find normally in communities, and, and in this case in particular, were that everybody within that area that this young girl and her mother resided, they knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was going on, and nobody reported until this little girl, it was noticed that she happened to be pregnant. And that's how law enforcement was involved. Um, so we're often in our community looking at these types of trafficking situations where our young children are being sexually assaulted and taken advantage of for goods, for places to stay, for food. Um, this 6% of boys surveyed here on the Rosebud through a program that White Buffalo Calf has um, that services young male survivors. Um, they had admitted to being forced to have sex by family members in exchange for food, goods, and drugs. So I coined the term, it's not the pimps, it's the parents, hashtag, uh, because that's the pri uh, predominant type of trafficking we see in our community. The other, the other one we often see and what we got the most phone calls for or response to were young Native women, LBGTQ, um, young men that were groomed online through, whether it's through Snapchat, Facebook, other types of chat groups, you know, people looking, young people looking for a different type of life than maybe what they have at the current time, and then um, being tricked into leaving the reservation. Um, and once they've been taken off here, usually into urban areas, then being forced into trafficking. We often got calls from family members that were really um, disturbed because um, I just got a call from my niece. She said she's in the city. She couldn't talk for long. She said she wasn't allowed to use the phone. Um, we're trying to find her. What can we do? Um, and often urban women, native, uh, whether they're women or young men or LBGTQ, um, are often forced or coerced into sex trafficking within those urban communities. So there's multiple levels about how we talk about sexual assault and trafficking. There is just not one answer. Um, to what we're looking at. And every single case always presents itself differently because we are as human beings different. How we react to situations is different. How we deal as advocates um, with sexual assault victims, with trafficking victims, um, really depends on your experience in your life, the, the visions or the visual that you see from your lenses. And often, and what we're going to talk about a little later, about how our policies and how training um, is involved to help us open up a little bit about um, how we serve uh, our relatives who are really um, stuck in this horrible consequences. Um, but we need to look at the beginning. How do people um become victimized by this venture often for and again uh, sorry for my gender specific wording whether it's for native women or children or lgbtq um we're looking at our youth um that have high level of homelessness and that's another thing we're not good at in indian country is really keeping data or seeking out data or information about really what is going on in our community. So one of the things that White Buffalo Calf had an opportunity to do was actually knock on doors and ask head of households in five different communities um, certain questions about the youth that were living in their homes. And for us, um, because of our level of poverty um, and just because of our family connections and our extended family connections. We often have multiple families living in one home with our lack of housing here. And one of the things we found out that really stressed to the homelessness issue on our reservation was that 
how many young um, girls and boys lived in the house between 9 and 18, um, and if they were living with their parents, with a mother and a boyfriend, a father and a girlfriend, father alone, mother alone, grandparents. And what we found out that was 50% of both the children that were identified as female and male within those households across the board did not live with their parents or grandparents. And often these youth were couch surfing or maybe living with the aunts or maybe living with friends. And this certainly puts uh, not just uh, children but others at risk when you do not have a place you can call home. And you're often forced to do things that you normally would never be involved with, um, but at the risk of being homeless, often people um, continually doing things they or facing risk they necessarily wouldn't. Abuse of drugs and alcohol within the homes, um, again, with all those factors we talked about, I don't necessarily know which communities you're from, but in our community, uh, we have a high rate of currently with methamphetamines, with heroin, and historically high levels of alcoholism within our community that we know for a fact through the years have really contributed to not just the amount of violence, but also to the amount of sexual assault. 95% uh, of the sexual assaults that take place in our community um, are either related around drugs or around um, alcohol abuse. The age of an individual, um, certainly those poverty levels. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about prior victimization and sexual abuse and, and poly victimization. And I often think about these when we talk about prior victimization. We are also talking about um, trauma, a tremendous amount of trauma uh, over and over again and how that impacts our lives and how that intersects with both the abuse of drugs and alcohol, risky behaviors, uh, incarceration, exposure to continual violence. Um, and so it's not just that you've had a prior victimization, whether it's a child sexual assault, whether it's an adult sexual assault situation, um, but it's often those other traumas that lead our people to continue to um, be re-victimized over and over again. And that really puts individuals at a high risk for trafficking um, so we and 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 how that intersects also with mental health problems often children and adults are misdiagnosed um, given mental health uh, determinations based on what really could be trauma um, so having those kinds of issues um, certainly leads to the risk factors um, for sexual assault and, um, and sex trafficking. Also, living in areas with high crime uh, is another risk factor. And children who are often in neglect and abusive situations um, leads to, so one of the things I'm really proud of White Buffalo Calf got involved with years ago was really taking a look at what happens to children in abuse and neglect situations when it comes to um, abnormal sexual behavior. So children who are left in neglectful situations or who are abused are at higher risk to not only become um, victims of another child in sexual abuse, but also, um, and we don't call children uh, predators, um, when they victimize another child sexually um, because they are children, they, they don't really have a predator mentality, but um, how that often leads to not just putting the child at risk that has been victimized by this type of situation, but a child that hasn't learned any kind of boundaries around their own sexuality and their boundaries around other people um, often will fall into situations where they, again, 
may be victimized again or fall into trafficking situations. And I just have to give a really heads up to the Polaris Project. I just, um, if you guys need a really good resource, I would check out their website. Um, they just have a tremendous amount of information. And that's really one of the things that um, we need to do um, as advocates and as agencies or programs that are dealing with sexual assault and trafficking with the Native communities is really looking around these issues um, surrounding trafficking and sexual assault in your community. So I identified some of those issues that happen in ours, that the use of drugs and alcohol, um, those poverty levels, the homelessness abuse um, that we have identified um, in our community so we can look at um, potential gaps and services that we may have um, so that we can plan ahead because if you can't identify the gaps within your community, um, then you're going to have a really hard time coming up with a solid plan because we don't do this. Uh, I know we often feel as advocates and agencies, sometimes we are um, set off in the corner and, and other people don't really uh, look at the work we're doing or recognizing that. But, you know, I'm a true believer that victim services really needs to be the polarizing agencies to bring other services, other agencies, law enforcement, all together to really have these conversations to learn to plan together. And so asking your sexual assault advocates to lead the way, um, because they are the ones that are more than likely to have those kinds of contacts with trafficking victims. Most of the tra trafficking, besides the ones that were off reservation that we would get phone calls about, most of those uh, trafficking victims, uh, the information came through, we would get a call for sexual assault. And we would respond um, normally to a hospital. Sometimes they would just come into our agency. And during uh, the exam or conversation by an advocate, or even just trying to provide services uh, to a victim of sexual assault, we would find out that actually this individual was being trafficked. And they were trying to find a way out. And so they would pick up the phone and report that they were sexually assaulted. And they were. Let's not make a mistake about that. They were. Uh, and really wanted services to be able to, or resources, um, to be able to become safe and to assist them in getting out of, uh, from underneath whoever was trafficking them, trafficking them. So it's really important to ask your sexual assault nurse examiners, your law enforcement, your SART teams, um, your criminal investigators, your federal partners, to really come together on a regular basis if you want to make a difference in the lives of trafficking victims, you know, those constant conversations, identification of gaps, um, and planning need to be done on a consistent basis. It's not about, oh, let's have a meeting, let's say this is what we're going to do, and then everybody goes their separate ways. Um, it, it just doesn't work. So being able to develop specific policies and procedures within your agency, um, you have to keep in mind that not all funders um, find that servicing trafficking victims, uh, if you identify them as trafficking victims, um, is acceptable. So we have to be careful. But you need to remember that trafficking victims are sexual assault victims. So if you are looking for funding or you do have funding, that allows you to provide services and resources to sexual assault victims, you don't necessarily have to call them a trafficking victim. I would, um, because you are providing those services to deal with uh, usually that immediate sexual assault issues, the trying to deal with the trauma, um, oftentimes support through any type of criminal case, protection orders, um, these types of situations and resources that you're uh, providing to victims. 
um, it's really important that you remember at the basis of it all is that they are sexual assault victims, but their their needs um, are are different. Um, often, trafficking victims have way more trauma, way more needs, um, and need a lot more time. So, one of the things that one of the first things that we did when we were starting to develop within our community about how to provide services to track track trafficking victims, excuse me, is we uh, looked at the amount of time our organization allowed like domestic violence victims or sexual assault victims to actually stay within the safety of a shelter. And so we decided that we would not put those kinds of time limitations on human trafficking victims. Really important that when you are doing this and getting everybody at the table, you really need to sit down and do MOUs. I mean, put people in those agencies in a place where they need to be. What can they give? What kind of resources can they give to um, helping to assist sexual assault victims, um, trafficking victims? Um, and MOUs are great because one of the things that happens is when you have some kind of staff turnover or leadership, um, demo MOUs go beyond those uh, personal uh, one person making decisions and really is getting those agencies, programs dedicated, organizations dedicated to assisting sexual assault and trafficking victims. Again, it's just not the relationships that you develop within the programs in your area. Let me tell you, trying to find services for traffic, trafficking victims, native um, sexual assault and trafficking victims, is not easy. They often require long time services, and we'll talk about what those look like, um, but really knowing who to call, because for us as an organization, way out here in the middle of South Dakota, and we have relatives calling about girls that were taken to Arizona, um, to Phoenix, taken to um, Minneapolis, taken to Chicago, um, working with law enforcement in those areas, trying to reach out to FBI agents, trying to find uh, good programming that would be um, helpful and healthy for uh, Native people is not easy. So really developing those resources and those relationships and really calling those programs and connecting with them and telling them what you're doing and, and what kind of needs um, you're seeing in your community because it is, even though we like to see ourselves as a one-stop shop, that often isn't true. And we really rely on other um, really good working people out there across the United States that are doing this work. So you have to think beyond the boundaries of your reservation, beyond the boundaries of your city. Making sure that you have regular trainings for advocates and service partners. I mean, you know, those yearly calendars really ahead of time about what kind of training you are going to provide as an agency for trafficking and sexual assault response is so important. And I don't know if some of you are as lucky as we are. We have Native coalitions within our area, but the Native Women's Society of the Great Plains, I mean, I have to give them straight up some great props because they provide training free of charge um, for the advocates within um, multi-states. And that really assists um, certainly not just our agency, but regionally about how we can respond because when we're all getting the same type of training, uh, it puts us on the same level of knowledge. And so really um, reaching out to those organizations that will come in, some other agencies charge to come in and do that kind of training, but it's real important that you plan ahead and you establish those regular trainings. Um, not just for advocates, but for law enforcement. Unfortunately, you know, not everybody believes in human trafficking. Um, I actually had, and I reported this individual 
Um, but an FBI agent say, well, you know, that's just a new buzzword, um, federal government buzzword, oh, human trafficking. And I was just, like, so shocked. But so, you know, we always have to be aware that not only within law enforcement, but within our own agencies, um, individuals that aren't educated about sexual assault or aren't educated about trafficking often use their own personal judgments. Um, against those individuals that may be caught up in that. So, you know, making sure that your plans and policies are in place, that training is a big part of that. You know, that development of long-term planning on how to identify and address trafficking in your area is so important. And it's not just an interagency thing. You know, this is something you should be talking to your community about. Often family members um, and even trafficking victims themselves have no idea about the types of resources that may be out there for them. So really spending time um, making sure that people within your community understand what trafficking is, understand those underlying issues of sexual abuse, um, and really looking at and we'll talk about that in a bit about those prevention types of situations, but also how we respond to that, that really needs to be part of your long-term planning. Um, and sometimes we get overwhelmed by the amount of work that we have. So we often, when we're responding to crises 24-7 um, as advocates, we often don't make enough time to sit down and do some strategic planning about that. And if you are having regular staff meetings, you know, really asking your staff to participate in or leading the way about how we're going to incorporate this training, not within just within your agency, but within all the service partners that work with you. Um, even spending 15 minutes in a staff meeting every time you meet on the subject, um, just incorporating that in there. So how are we going to do the training? Um, what's going on with our plan? And, and when are we going to take some time to actually sit down and make sure we have this long-term plan? Because if you're not making a priority, um, it, it's just not going to happen. And I understand how crazy the advocate world is. I'm steeped in it for years. So really being determined that your agency is going to do the best job it can, it can to address some of these issues that are going on in your community and really providing um, that time is so important. So um, otherwise it's, it's, it's not going to change and you're not really going to um, be effective. So, you know, we really have to be careful about who works with trafficking victims. Working with sexual assault victims um, who are often, if we're working with domestic violence victims, they often are sexual assault victims also. Um, having dedicated sexual assault advocates um, who have had specialized training that come from a really empathetic place is really important when um, dealing with human trafficking victims. Uh, a lot of times it is uh, just an exposure to what happens in that world of trafficking is so out of the norm for all of us that even trying to understand where this individual is coming from sometimes makes it really hard. And if someone... And you know the deal. When you're an advocate, you know, we're not into asking too many questions. But if you really are trying to identify who are traffic victims, and, you know, maybe she doesn't necessarily understand that either. Is this what this looks like? This guy loved me. You know, he said he was going to do this and this for me. Um, we started doing drugs together. Next thing I know, he's telling me I have to go and have sex with this individual in order for us to get a drug, to get drugs, if I don't, he may report me for using drugs. Um, often get coerced 
and forced into situations like that. Um, and sometimes it gets get a little bit more physical. But does that sexual assault victim, that actual trapping vi trafficking victim, identify themselves as a trafficking victim? So these um, next two slides are really just talking about um, maybe some types of questions you could ask if you need to assist as an advocate. But we never want you to force these questions. Please do not make them like a policy to ask every sexual assault victim because, as you know, there's a fine line in advocacy about how much information um, you know we actually ask for. Are we then um, pushing our relative a little bit too far um, in trying to provide them services? So we really have to be um, careful about this. Um, has anybody forced you to have sex against your will for any type of favors or money? Has anybody ever taken photos of you? Um, what they use them for? A lot of times um, individuals would be forced, and that's a type of trafficking too, into pornography. Um, and without even realizing um, that the individuals that are coercing or forcing them to have these photographs, that they're using that for their profit. Um, did anybody ever force you to engage in commercial sex through online websites, escort services, actual street prostitution, informal arrangements? Um, I don't. I, it, that's supposed to be brothels, not brothers. <laughs> uh, massa massage parlors or strip clubs. Um, often, you know, people don't identify themselves as being trafficking victims. Again, um, and and may not put that information together. But you need to keep in mind that there is many ways individuals can be trafficked, whether it's being forced into doing some type of pornographic photos or videos, whether they are forced actually into a home and not let go. We know um, from relatives that we worked with, trafficking relatives that we've worked with in the past, that they were often forced into um, trafficking, uh, kept at a certain location, weren't allowed to live, were actually on lockdown, and, um, and then forced to have sex or being raped over and over by people that were then paying these individuals, um, the traffickers. So when we think about human trafficking and when we think about sexual assault, um, you know, we can't just think of it as a linear type of situation. Um, often relatives who have dealt with multiple types of victimization, um, especially when it comes to sexual assault, may not see, and if they were brought up in that kind of manner, if it's, you know, they won't see themselves as trafficking victims if really that's all they've ever known. So it is just like one continual sexual assault, um, and they don't often see that. So we need to be careful about how ourselves as advocates respond, um, because victims often fall into all these different types of services. Um, Yeah, so we need to keep an open mind um, when we're looking about how to provide services. Were you allowed to communicate with your family and friends? Were you afraid someone might harm your family? Often victims are threatened um, that that will happen. So um, they, they won't ever contact their family. You know, we'll hurt them. Uh, this Third question, were you threatened with police or court action if you do not participate? You know, this we often see this with victims who are trafficked within um, the drug world. Uh, they become addicts themselves and then are coerced or often forced into trafficking um, and then are threatened. Um, we'll turn you in. Uh, sometimes uh, relatives will have children. Uh, they're often threatened with court action for neglect and abuse charges. Um, maybe they have warrants. Um, that's often used against them also. So, uh, you know, you really need to be careful because a lot of times sexual assault victims who are being trafficked 
um, won't even want to report. They may, re you know, go to your agency because they want um, help, but they don't necessarily want to go to the police or the courts because of these types of threats. And please, 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 whatever you do, do not question children. And what I mean by that is um, normally within Indian communities, certainly the policy for Indian Health Services is that everybody over the age of 13 um, can uh, receive a rape examination if they ask for it. Um, anybody else, or if you have individuals that you may be working with that have either mental health issues or have some type of disability, you really want to be able to have a local experience um, forensic examiners, whether that's a physical exam or an interview, um, because when advocates, good meaning advocates, I've seen it, or parents really want to know more information about what has happened to this child, because, and, and I'm saying that's coming out of a really caring space for a parent or an advocate, um, often make the mistake of trying to ask children questions. When you do that, you may change that child's narrative. So you need to leave that up to professionals to do. Don't ever ask children questions about the trafficking or any type of sexual assault. Uh, that will prove to be harmful to the child, harmful to any kind of case that may be out there if, if it's for law enforcement. Um, and when you're talking to parents or caretakers, you really need to gently remind them not to ask questions of these children and to allow, um, and it's hard to do. You know, as a parent, you, you want to know what's happened. You want to know who harmed a child. Um, but really being in that advocate role, we need to really advocate for that child and really assist parents through that kind of desperate situation and allow the professionals to do the questioning of children. So I was going to do this video, but it wasn't OVW approved. So uh, I will put a plug out there for it. It is on YouTube. It's a really good um, video um, made by Polaris, too, but from a trafficking victim's um, perspective. So it's really, you know, trained um, who should work with victims, sexual assault advocates who've had the training on trafficking, advocates who are really compassionate for the relatives um, who have been raped more than once, um, advocates who are more experienced and have solid connections. Um, and, and the reason I say this is you do not want to just hire an advocate, throw some training at them, and then allow them to respond to um, trafficking victims. Their needs are way different um, than the needs of other types of victims. And you have to be really careful. And having those policies in place um, before your agency uh, really tries to dive in. I mean, of course, you're not going to turn anybody away that comes to your door, but you really want to be careful about the kind of work that you do with trafficking victims and who's actually doing that interface with them. Um, and really having those empathetic attitudes. I mean, not all of us are as empathetic as we should be. Some have a lot more experience. Of course, that's why we're a team, because we all have uh, different traits and different gifts, and so uh, you need to pick those people in your agencies that have more experience um, and can be as empathetic as possible. Um, we also need to really train anybody that um, answers our crisis lines about trafficking and sexual assault. They need to have those resources, not recourses, those resources at their fingertips. Um, because that may be the only uh, connection that particular relative who's been trafficked or sexual, has sexual, been sexually assaulted in that, um, that they can actually uh, be able to give them information. So we need to make sure that our advocates are trained, that they have all the resources that they need 
at their finger, fingertips. And, and what do trafficking victims need? Um, so much. Victims who have been taken, forced to have sex, been sexually assaulted over and over again, not, it, it's not just their physical needs, it's really their trauma. Um, and we're going to talk about, like, all these little pieces that need to be connected together. And so often that long-term services, um, most trafficking programs that have uh, housing or shelters for trafficking victims, you know, out there, they say at least a year. Trafficking victims need a place to be for at least a year. They need to learn and have assistance about how to access housing. What do they do for medical care? Um, what kind of resources are out there? Um, counseling and information is so important. I mean, the personality differences in trafficking victims, no matter what kind of situation they were, whether they were forced into it, if they were coerced, whether they were working out of a massage parlor or a bar, or whether they were a child victim, um, really need this multi-level of care and continued support. Um, so counseling services, um, I also really like to um, put together with more traditional and cultural types of experiences. So if you have that in your community or your agency provides that, it's so important to try to marry the two together. How do you take that traditional modern therapy, look at what types of services, traditional cultural healing practices you have in your community and be able to marry the two together so that uh, this individual has multi-levels of opportunity to be able to heal from their trauma. And, and that also includes, you know, those mental health types of uh, assessments that they need, sometimes inpatient, um, those drug and alcohol assessments and assistance with um, the need to be able to uh, be sober and stay sober um, while they're working through their trauma, um, different types of material assistance. Um, they're going to come to you, like a lot of our relatives come to our agencies, really with nothing. Um, and how do they become employed? You know, for... So I, I began this um, uh, presentation by letting people know that uh, my sister um, was, at the age of 13, a victim of child trafficking. And this continued um, well into her 20s. And when she did, was able to get out of that situation and, and really start to have a life, you know, of course, she didn't graduate from high school. She didn't have any kind of job to put on her resume. Um, she didn't have any kind of training. And how do you provide those services that will address uh, those kinds of issues? So um, learning about um, what kind of services you may have in your area for employment training, um, education was her saving grace. I'm, I'm happy to say, uh, you know, 30-something years later, she, you know, got her bachelor's in business um, and accounting. Uh, she's fully employable and has been um, employed uh, for those 30 years and truly, you know, shows a lot of leadership. Um, but we need to be able to, and, and with high unemployment rates, Normally, um, it's, it's hard to find those kind of resources locally. Um, what types of educational opportunities do they need? Do they need their GED? Can they go to a local college? I mean, really assisting them 
um, to be able to get a jump start on life and any kind of training opportunities for them also. The other thing I think I've seen um, in recent years is really trying to get away from support groups. I don't know, agencies don't often, often necessarily do that, but for trafficking victims, peer-to-peer -peer support. And if you don't want to call them support groups, I mean, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer support of other trafficking victim, victims really go a long way in assisting um, trafficking victims and sexual assault victims to really feel like they are not alone, like they're the only one. Because, of course, what comes along with this is all that shame. I mean, it took my sister... Um, and, you know, like I said, she was trafficked. And, and it was only, like, maybe four years ago that she actually came out um, and was ready to tell the rest of the world. And it was something that our family just really kept quiet. We didn't have conversations about it um, with each other. Um, and it was because of her need not to let anybody know that, uh, this had happened to her. So when you are looking at assisting trafficking and sexual assault victims, um, you have to understand that underlying shame base that comes with that. And being able just to step out in the world and say, hey, I'm a trafficking victim is not uh, something a lot of victims are able to do. Not that you want them to do that, but certainly in a peer-to-peer type of situation, it is very useful um, so that they can stand with each other, gain strength from each other, and certainly see that they don't have to be ashamed about what happened to them um, and that there's other people to help them create a new life beyond that. Um, sometimes in the legal systems, you know, victims can sue and get money for what happened to them. Um, they're often, often going to need some type of legal help, whether that's gaining custody back of children they may have lost, whether that's because they have these old records sitting there. A lot of jurisdictions will now purge the records of trafficking victims um, because they have all kinds of charges, normally for prostitution, um, different types of, you know, whatever. If they're out there on the streets, um, they are definitely going to get caught at one point or the other, but I really believe that our legal systems, and certainly I hope in your, in your tribal communities, that they are ready to stand up and say, hey, we need to recognize that this is an issue, that our relatives have been forced into this type of situation, and so what can we do to assist our, our relatives and our communities that have been harmed by this to assist them in having to overcome all of these legal hurdles. So, um, you know, really making sure that it's not just changing your laws to human trafficking. It's also looking at other types of laws that may be continuing. Um, and you can expunge those records for trafficking victims. And really, um, don't forget about our LGBTQ community and all the other types of unique set of situations situations and challenges. I know a lot of times in our changing world, even for old school kind of advocate shelter situations, the conversation about should men be in shelters, well then are you looking at our two-spirit relatives and saying it's okay for people who identify as being a woman to come into shelter, but you know, what about the men and other um, those other gender identities? And why are we excluding them? Even though we say we offer them equal treatment, that is not necessarily true across the United States or agencies in the way that we treat all of our relatives. And, and I truly believe that we should be treating them the same. So um, making sure that when you are planning and you are looking at resources, that you are asking those in your community that are the local ex experts. What kinds of needs do you have? What can we do to assist you to go forward and have a better life? So really quickly, I just want to pause. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments up to this point? 
Once again, you can put them in the chat box or there's a little button up near the top left uh, or top middle that says set status. It looks like a little arm. If you click on that, it should show us uh, next to your icon that you have a question. Okay. Okay. So, you know, and what is the even bigger picture? I mean, already I've just loaded all kinds of work on you guys when you're taking a look at what you're doing in your community, but really I can't express the need for training, 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 consistent training, planning for long-term training. What are we going to do next year? How can we build upon this? You know, really making sure that you're connecting with schools, social services, hospitals to help them identify um, and, and certainly educate youth about um, not just your resources, but their resources and what are their reporting requirements. I mean, I think about this young 11-year-old girl in our community who was being trafficked and how many people that lived around her that knew it and nobody picked up the phone this little girl was being continually raped and nobody did anything so it is our responsibility as advocates as community members as tribal members as a bigger picture of our place in this world to really make sure that we're putting those protective factors and really educating our youth about this issue and what are the resources out there what's going on with the homeless youth do they know about your programming do they know that you're there to assist them and certainly uh, training law enforcement court staff prosecutors you know they don't understand these dynamics you know they're looking at the law this is how I need to respond this is what I need to do but often don't understand what those dynamics about what re-victimization is what does trafficking do to an individual what does sexual assault and those uh, multiple victimizations do to individuals um, and making sure we're training our tribal on this too you know making changes in our laws um, you know, protection and support for our victims within our communities. Uh, please, there are so many ways to produce really good media. I mean, Facebook posts, Instagram, I mean, whatever you need to do to connect um, the world together and really give them good information. And I'm telling you, just about popping out a tweet or weekly or putting something on Instagram or something on Facebook um, Facebook on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis about trafficking, that will spread. That educates people. And where are the local resources? And really what I believe is that it's, it's more basic than that. We as victim services, and, I, and I'm an advocate. I'll be a lifelong advocate. It is my duty, your dirty duty, to provide services without any kind of judgment and really come from a compassionate place in our heart. So, and, you know, developing those agency resource guides for trafficking and sexual assault victims is also really important when it comes to long-term education. I have put these resources up. I know they said uh, that they also have a PDF file. I'm telling you, um, there are some really good information on these links. Um, that uh, OVC map that you see third down, actually you can go onto that site. You guys can save it on your agency computers and be able to hop it up anytime you want. But you will be able to link with all kinds of human trafficking um, resources, not just in within your general area, but across the United States. Um, uh, the fourth link down, they will actually come to your community and provide training. So all of these are just really good, a bunch of good information. I hope um, what has um, any information I've given you today has uh, helped you. 
Um, it's certainly been an honor for me to be in this space with you. And again, I would ask you if you have any questions to go ahead and ask. Well, I don't see anybody um, asking questions. Again, thank you. Thank you um, for being with us today and all of us sharing this space. And I wish you good luck in your work that you're doing out there. And thank you for being advocates. Often we don't get the applause we need, but um, what would our relatives do without you not being in this space? Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. Before we end the call, I want to let you know about our upcoming webinars. So next week on Monday, we have Technology Use in Violence Against Children and Youth. And that will be once again next week on Monday, same time. And then on September 30th, we will be having Legal Considerations when providing advocacy to children and youth, once again same time. Uh, if you have any issues with the technology use registration, uh, let me know. I can type in my email here. So if you have any issues with that whatsoever, you can email me there and I will try and see what's going on. Uh, also, once again, uh, Janet mentioned earlier that she had a video she wanted to show. Uh, if any of you are interested, we can email it to you this week. Um, we have your emails from your registrations, so you don't need to provide them. Um, and with that said, I'd like to thank our presenter, Janet, our host, Patricia, and all of you for joining us. And we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you all. Thank Thank you.